Hello, Stitchers. Welcome to Stitch Please, the official podcast of Black Women's Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. I'm your host, Lisa Woolfork. I'm a fourth generation sewing enthusiast with more than 20 years of sewing experience. I am looking forward to today's conversation. So sit back, relax, and get ready to get your stitch together. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another amazing episode of the Stitch Please podcast. Florence Taylor is an actor, a mom, a creative, a rare talent. And when I look at her photos, I feel like I am looking at a person on stage. Take a pause right now. Go to Instagram and put in F T. M O M three. So the chance to talk to the the lady behind the photo is a great treat today. Welcome to Stitch Please Podcast, Florence. Thank you for joining us. No, thank you, Lisa, and thank you so much for inviting me to this conversation. Thank you to all your amazing listeners and your supporters. So hi, everyone. Yes, hello, hello, y'all. Florence Taylor is a delight. She does so much and continues to do so much in the sewing community. She is one of those reliable, trustworthy voices that I turn to. She works with so many different companies in different capacities, supporting so many small business owners, so many small Black business owners, so many small Black women business owners through the fabric industry. And I'm so grateful for it. So I, so welcome, Florence. And I want to get started with a kind of a broad umbrella of a question. If you were writing Florence Taylor, the play on Broadway, and part of her character description was a sewing philosophy, what would it be? I look at sewing as my love language to myself, to my family, to my friends. So it's wearable love. Wearable love. That is so beautiful. Because sewing came from a place of love for me when I didn't think I, um, I was worthy of it. And when it was missing in terms of a void of my mom um, passing away. So when anybody that I love wears something that I make, they have to know that I literally whisper into the sewing. That's why I sew with an old machine. Um, I whisper thoughts and I say things aloud, like if I'm making something for my son, I, I, in this climate, when I make him something, I'm like, I hope this is bright and someone sees him. I hope that this doesn't attract too much attention, but yet makes him stand out. I hope that when he's walking in this, someone sees that he is somebody that is worthy to still make it home. I'm not even kidding. I literally whisper these incantations for him, for my husband, and even for my daughters sometimes. I just want them to be noticed in the sense that they're remembered, yes. but they don't have to be memorialized. Yes. I love it. And I am so grateful to you for articulating that so clearly because it reminds, it reminds me of so many things at once. First, when you think about your sewing as a love language, it is a communication. It is a process of exchange. It's something that you are giving, but also you are receiving. Absolutely. And that I think is really very powerful. It's important, I think, to recognize that, the things that animate us, the things that shape us and drive us. That is so vital. At the same time, I also, I'm getting this kind of whole Old Testament Bible vibe, right? Yeah. From the incantation yes. and the prayers. Because what I'm remembering is um, the story of Moses' mother. Mm. Wove this basket for Moses to go in. Yeah. She knew that to keep him safe, she had to let him go. Yeah. Having a, a Hebrew baby in this time was death yeah. for the child. So that the Pharaoh was calling for the destruction of black, of uh, black, I'm calling them black, but destruction of Hebrew children in the same way we see the state arranged against our children. Yes, absolutely. And so, and so the way that she was weaving that basket to put him in and saying, you know what, I'm, I'm sending you out into uncertainty. But one thing I want you to never forget is I love Absolutely. you. Absolutely. And, and, and it's such a beautiful process to kind of imagine you sitting at the machine and knowing 
that we what we know as black mothers that there's nothing we can do nothing once they are out of our sight yeah. you know uh, but we can invest our children in knowing their worth their value uh, we send up prayer yeah we call on our ancestors to protect and watch over them. Um, and that we do that through the craft of sewing. Yeah. You've told this beautiful story about the love language of sewing. And so tell me a bit about um, something that I tend to get feedback from people um, from sometimes is, hey, well, we said, you know, we want to think about sewing as just sewing, as just making a shirt or making a blouse or making some leggings. Why do you need to bring in things like size or blackness or feminism or social justice? These things are totally separate, but we know as black women, they are not. How, would, how do you respond if someone is like, well, I don't see why this has to be about advocacy. Let's keep it basic and neutral. Um, what's that about? Our bodies are this beautiful canvas, right? It should be a description of who we are and how we want to be received. So I think within the sewing community itself, that is so important. I under I know we can't reach out and touch everyone and everyone's story and narrative, but we have an obligation in a sense to let other humans know that we see their individualism, that we see the uniqueness of who they are. Um, I have a way of describing the people that come into my life as pieces of my life tapestry. And within a tapestry, there are different hues, there are different shapes, there are different textures if you're lucky. And at the end, it is this beautiful framework and piecework that you have to pull from and say, this is who you are. I am not that Eurocentric ideal of beauty. Heck, I'm not even the black woman standard of beauty outside of having a big bust and an ample behind, but I have a tummy. And I don't know who these B BBW women are without a waist, but <laughs> that's not this story. How do, you, how do you have a booty and thigh gap? Like, how, how do you put it? Like, you can't have a, you can't have thick thighs, save lives, a lovely booty ass, a beauty, booty delicious booty, and a thigh gap. Why? I, I never understood how thigh gap became an ideal because I, I don't know either because I, I mean, I like a bow legged man, but, <laughs> <laughs> but my husband ain't never said, Ooh, look at that thigh gap happening. <laughs> it took so long for me to even appreciate that. And that was through one of my beautiful tapestry sewist sisters, Veronica Bell, Cole, you go on the thread, who is... Oh, she is the bomb.com. She's so great. She's everything that I wish I could have been 10 years ago and I aspire to be now. So she made me start to really appreciate my body more. I wasn't listening to my children who were consistently telling me how much they loved all my parts. And I was a disservice to them because they're young and they're children. They're saying things just so please you, right? But as you get older and as they get older and teenagers and they still see the beautiful uniqueness of you, you have to take a step back and say, okay, maybe, maybe there is more to me than being this mom. Maybe they actually see the woman of who I am. And I, I love that too, because sometimes when we're in a position of preparing to spiral, we're able to discount those parts of the story that don't confirm our negative thinking about ourselves. Oh, well, he's my husband, so he's going to say that. Or, They're my kids. They're just saying that, you know? And I think it has to do with, as you were saying, like honoring their truths as well. Yeah. I guess the question for me at the end of the day becomes, who is being served by your self-doubt? <sighs> wow. Who benefits from it? You know, you don't benefit, right? 
Yeah. Who benefits? And it feels like the diet industry benefits, uh, capitalism benefits, you know, that, that, that these things are kind of deployed in a way that make us, you know, either buy products or whatever um, to, to fix our broken selves. When we, but if we realize that we're not broken, we can buy less shit. The monetization of the self-doubt is one thing. That's that that spiritual assault of of ourselves. That is a that breeds for me a next generation of those that are fractured and broken. And there's nothing wrong with being broken if you understand where the jagged edges piece, pieces come, right? So if you think about yourself as um, a window pane is whole, right? There's no cracks to it, but it's stained glass. It's broken, but beautiful in the sense that it ha it still brings in light, but it illuminates it in so many different hues. And that's what I think human beings are. We have to start looking at ourselves, not as just plain window panes. We have, a, we have the potential of being just as beautiful and as necessary as stained glasses, which are, are works of art, to be perfectly honest. Now, I want to talk about the story of your garments. And when you go to create a look, um, I was thinking about like one of the things I find so appealing about your um, your Instagram profile is that it's almost like each image is very different. Like you, you are unafraid to change a hairstyle, change the setup, photograph here, photograph there. When you're creating your garments, do you start to think about them in advance about what kind of photo setups you're going to do? Do you think about styling and that kind of thing from the very beginning? Or does that something that comes to you after things are finished? It starts with the fabric. So I have almost a sensual love affair with fabric. My husband has looked at me sometimes stroking some silk and he's like, oh, okay. All right. Um, I think I'm prepared to be jealous. <laughs> and, 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 and it could be different things within the fabric, whether it's the color, whether it's the texture, whether who I got it from, if it was a gift, if there's a story behind the design, or if it brings a sense of um, a muscle memory or heart memory to me. The, the pattern then comes into mind. Then it goes to the wigs. This is how I create the different persona. Every wig, my wigs are my different superheroes. So if there was this, I'm Wigorama. Like I'm like, there's 50 wigs. And I'm like, who does she want to be today? And I and with COVID, I learned how to make wigs. Of all the things that 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 you make, I did not know that you actually make some wigs. Yeah, I make some of my wigs. I was just like, you know what? I went on YouTube. I said, boom, here it is. And then it, it was just another it was just another creative process. I didn't realize how creative I was until I learned how to sew because I come from a family of seamstresses slash sewists. I didn't realize how from my communion dress, my confirmation, sweet 16, every, my wedding dress, my money bag from my wedding gown. Every time I had a heart memory, someone in my family created it. And when I learned how to sew, it, it's like it opened up this third eye for me and made me realize that I was so creative. My dad told me that I've always seen in color. Mm. That I have never been able to just see black and white. I, what, I've i always seen things in different shades. So when I create um, and I post the pictures, I want people to have like a sense of, <laughs> there's, there's, what they're seeing is all me. And the uniqueness of being a black woman is that we know how to code switch. Yes, yes. So yes. I'm going to never be that that stereotypical way of how people think. No one would think that I like goth, that I like country music, that I love opera. I love country and westerns, and all those things have a story and a reason. You know, being a, a first generation born American, my parents are immigrants in Haiti. All they had was cowboy movies and Western movies. Oh, yeah. So they grew to love Westerns and country music. So growing up, my dad would be sitting, we would drive to Canada and he would sit in the car with my mom and sing that gambler cassette 
from Kenny Rogers. And so you look at me and you're like, what is she trying to tell in this, in this post? Like I posted something just the other day and somebody was like, you know, I felt, I felt like a total baddie. I was having a horrible day and I didn't want to take the pictures. I wasn't sure about how my body looked in this crop top. I was like, no, this is not for me. I said, you can see my stomach, there's too much of it showing. And my daughter said, mama, that was the first place that I ever felt loved and safe. I love your belly. Let's show your belly and more of it, please. And um, <laughs> it's scarred and it's got- <laughs> I guess tiger stripes. Oh yeah, tiger stripes, it's got uh, my gastric bypass, uh, scars. It's got my cesarean scar. It's got a scar where somebody um, cut me. It's a roadmap to <laughs> destination Florence. I don't know if everyone wants to take the ride. Absolutely. And it, it's the scars are scars are stories. That's what it is. Beautiful about this Florence, because I'm not saying that, you know, that, that you like put these words in your daughter's mouth. I am saying that you have created an environment of love for your children that they can practice all the time. And it's kind of like they, you, have, you have fortified them so beautifully that they are able to recognize and help you push past your own limitations. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Which is beautiful, right? I was lucky in having a beautiful mother. I mean... Her name was Immacula and just her name is so beautiful, oh, right? Oh my gosh, powerful. She was, I didn't, I, oh, I didn't realize how magical she was. She was that beautiful director that sh made everyone shine and never got the glory. She was literally everyone's light. She spotlighted you for all your good, for yeah. all your ugly, <laughs> but um just beautiful and my i'm blessed to still have my father and he's he's walking magic yeah. he he his voice is melodical he sings he makes you feel loved and so i look and i see my children reflected in them all i want is to have children that are creative that are givers that know how to give love and accept love because being givers, we don't know how to always accept that. Yes, yes, yes. And I don't want them to be shortchanged in the gift of being able to accept love back. And this becomes a way for us to talk about questions of size inclusivity in sewing, which has become of late much more discussed, much more of a, a, a topic that is um, that sh should have been addressed a long time ago, mm -hmm. but I think people are becoming far more vocal about it, um, that there are accounts and, um, and folks who are in really important, I, I guess leadership is a word that some would use, but I think the better word is possibility model. Hey friends, hey. The Stitch Please podcast is about to publish its 100th episode. That's right. 100 episodes. As part of the celebration, we are launching 100 by 100 to help us get 100 more Patreon supporters by the 100th episode publication date on September 15th, 2021. 100 additional Patreon supporters would give us the financial stability we need to hire editorial and production help. You can find the links to our Patreon in the show notes. Thank you so much for considering this and thank you current and future Patreon supporters. It becomes so important, particularly in a visual medium like Instagram, to see a variety and range of possibilities because it is very hard to do something you have never seen. Yeah, and, absolutely. And so when I think about, as you were mentioning, Aronica as being like a friend, a heart friend, a heart sister, and a mentor, I think that she's also a possibility model. And I think you too are a possibility model. I think you are a possibility model for your children, obviously, as demonstrated. And you're also a possibility model for all the people on Instagram who are following you, who are thinking about their sewing, 
who want to learn to practice um, the craft of sewing, yeah. um, who want to be recognized in and by aspects and scenes on the, in the sewing industry or in the sewing community. And I think you do that so well. I think for me, size inclusion is so important because I have looked at both the different spectrums of size, right? From our beautiful, wonderful, smaller stature petites to our wonderful high rise, glorious, curvy pluses. And all of, typically most of weight or weight loss stems from some kind of trauma or some hurt. When I was contemplating eventually getting my PhD, I was looking at like weight in relation to weight and how it, it, it ties to abuse, verbal, physical, sexual, trigger warning, sorry, everyone. And for me, my weight was from sexual abuse, hiding, not wanting to be seen, hoping that as the weight ballooned, I would be less appealing to the others. Unfortunately, because I wanted to be less appealing to others, you start taking on that characteristic and start internalizing that to yourself. And learning to love all of my parts that encompass my sum is important within clothing. Yes. I want to be able to make something that makes me feel good. It doesn't have to make anyone think I look good and that I look beautiful. I want to create something that feels good to me, that is comfortable, that is flirty, that's fast, um, yes. that fits. Yes, that. Because there's something, when it fits, it makes you feel that you're seen. I, I feel like, you know, because sewing is something that you do in private, but also then becomes public, it becomes this thing that you really want to, at least for me, I can't say what anyone else does, but for me, everyone, I, I wanna put my best foot forward. I wanna go out in something that feels good to me, that feels right to me, that makes me feel good about myself. And so much of that is, it feels like sometimes if you give up your power, then you are gonna be at the whim of everybody. Every strong wind, every unkind word is gonna knock you down. You're gonna believe, you're gonna believe everybody else's story about you. Even people you don't even fucking know, let alone like. But when you start from the position of, I am wearing what I like because I like it. And my opinion about myself matters more than anybody else's. Yeah. And I, and I, and I find that to be true in terms of sewing for me, but also sewing for teenagers. Right. Yeah. So my two, my twins are 13. My son is 15 and sewing for them is interesting in the sense, because as my son is very muscular, he's 15, he's a teenager, he's a kid. Um, unfortunately outside does not see him that way. He will be labeled not as a teenager. If something happens, he will be young male young man, not 15 year old, they won't slap his age. They won't slap that number to make him uh, palatable, right? Because that's not what media does. It's not, that's not how we, um, that's not the sound bite that works for them. I want him to be very comfortable and I want him, he's a cool, he's a cool, like aesthetic. He's like part Rat Pack, um, activist and skater boy he can he he doesn't he doesn't realize that he is a leader because society has told him that he should be a sheep and quiet but he is very much a leader he walks in he's attention grabbing without being attention seeking i want him to be noticeable but not always noticed for my girls they are totally different. They love bright colors. They love vibrancy. Lila loves stripes and polka dots. Carrie loves, she will wear all things purple. That has always been her color. She came out like looking <laughs> like Lila. 
and she loves color. So dressing teens is all about, I have their input with the pattern and the fabric. No one ever dresses like them. You can always tell who my children are. That's right, that's right. And I love how they're like, so as, and that was one thing I was thinking, as your children age, you know, as our children grow, their needs grow, their needs. And it's mm -hmm. really wonderful that you have been able to keep your kids in me made like 50% for your son now that he's, you know, transitioning to the upper teen years. But for the girls, for the twins, the younger ones, that they're still at like 90%. What kind of advice would you give to someone who wanted to sew for their kids? What I would say is for someone starting off with littles is not to take on more than you're prepared to do because you want to create something for that for that little human that you have that's appe appealing to you, that highlights and... Um, helps illustrate the story of your family and your love language. If you're the, the parent that likes to jog, do something like that. Incorporate your interest in what you're sewing. Now, as they get older, absolutely. Have them go on Pinterest. Ask them what kind of look do they like. If they, you're out with them, look at who they're gravitating to in terms of like, and, and they may not turn their heads, but they always avert their eyes. Look where their eyes are traveling to. And, and then be honest, have an open conversation with them and say, I, I made that dress for you. or I made those pants for you. You didn't seem to like them. No, they either didn't fit or they weren't my style. Okay, what's your style? Ask the question, you know, incorporate them in it, whether it's, and there's something wonderful if you let them go through your stash, because they may find something that one, you didn't even think that they would have liked because it just, it just might, Again, it goes back to that heart memory. They may have a heart memory of something to them that's personal. What's the story my kid is trying to say? So this is my time to be the listener and I'm going to listen to them. I, I love that so much because what it's making me think about is the ways in which your sewing is equipping. And by equipping, I mean, you are preparing people, yourself, the things you make for yourself, the things you make for your family, you are equipping them to claim their whole yeah. selves. And it's in the same way that your sewing equips you to claim your whole self. Yeah. And, I, and also the way that when you post your images, when you do the pattern tests, when you do sew fabric strikes for um, designers, you are also equipping not just these, these pattern companies and these fabric businesses, you are also equipping other people who sew, other women who sew, to see for themselves what is possible. You know, Lisa, I got into sewing to heal myself from the loss of my mom because I didn't know who I was. I didn't know how to be Florence without being puppet. That's my family, Puppet is my family nickname. I didn't have the person who loved me from, from the minute that they saw me anymore. And I did it, and who I was becoming was the exact opposite of who I should have been. So I went to therapy and I said, you know what? I think I wanna honor my mom and my grandmothers by learning how to sew. And I learned to sew March 17, March 15th of 2017. I made my daughter a butt ugly dress. That dress is still in her closet. She still looks at it. She smiles when she sees it. So that was, ex that was exciting. And then I got into starting to make more for them, make more for me. Every time I made them something, it was like, you know, like the shoemaker and they would, the kids would go to sleep and the elves, I was the elf making the shoes in the middle of the night, but it was closed. Right. And every day they'd wake up to something new and it was like so exciting for them. And then I got into pattern testing and strike sewing. And the only reason I did that is that I realized I was fortunate enough to have a job and an income separate from sewing because I don't make any money sewing, right? Mm -hmm. I don't have a business. I don't have a blog. I'm just sewing. 
I realized how important in everyone that I test and I so for, I, I'm not even kidding when I say I want them to win in terms of themselves, their value, their families, the quality of life that they have for themselves. I've only started now to earn a little bit of money sewing, but guess what? I don't keep the money for myself. I either will give a piece to the kids if they take, cause my kids take my pictures. Yeah. My babies take my yes. pictures for me on my phone, not a camera y'all. <laughs> on my phone and so much love in them so this makes sense to me there's so much love in them so the money the little bit of money you're making from sewing now you you pay your you pay your your I, I people pay my people and i donate it to food insecure charities to either schools or i will buy gift cards to restaurants and say if you know that there's a family struggling can you donate it to them because we live in a country where our children are food insecure and our elderly are food insecure and that's ridiculous. What it tends to go back to, and what I love hearing from you, is this investment. That as a strike team member, you invest in a business. Yep. When you agree to sew someone's fabric, you, you are doing so because, as you said, you want them to win. And so you are putting like your own sweat equity by sewing and cutting and washing and creating and, and, and thinking of something, then posting the pictures, making the pictures and posting and tagging. Like it's a, it's a real it process. Is. And another form of like a labor it of is. love. Your generosity is helping the sewing community by providing possibility models for inclusion, for race, gender, size, the totality of it. And you are equipping and modeling for your family, like what it means to give and not be depleted yeah. by giving. And that is something that I think is so important. We are going to need to wrap this up because time flies when you're having and fun. fun. So I'm hoping to talk, get a chance to talk again soon, but tell me a bit about what's coming up next for you. Like what are some of the things you're looking forward to um, as you move through your sewing journey? So for me, I wanna go into more philanthropy in terms of monetizing my affiliate links. I would, I, I want to design. Um, I want to appear in more lookbooks. I want more plus size, um, petite representation. I want more BIPOC LGBTQI plus representation. I want over 45 representation. I want us to start healing in weaving and creating. I want fiber to become family. Yes, fiber to family. Yeah. Fiber to family. Like it, it it's it's not hard, everyone. If you just take time to start loving yourselves, you are going to start loving one another so much better. How I how how I've told people is when I do diversity inclusion meetings, when I'm trying to have people understand why it's important in theater, yeah. is you, your heart should be a, your heart should be clear in who you are. Like when someone sees you, they should see who you who you are and what your heart represents. And I think that we have an opportunity to do that within this sewing community, listening to each other, acknowledging, and amending. Yes, repair. And and just just being kind and thoughtful to one another and starting with ourselves. And I absolutely love you saying that loving yourself deeply and well is the first step to engaging and creating a community based in love and care. To everyone out there who's listening or if they're looking, anytime that you hit a like or you say something, you're not feeding my ego. What you're feeding is that little girl who was abused that didn't speak out for herself, who didn't know that she had advocates out there for her. You're speaking mm -hmm. out and you are showing my children that yeah. the parent that they, that they love is loved by you. And you, by doing that, are showing that you are loving and that you know how to love and be able to receive love. So I want to say thank you to everybody 
who ever drops me a line, who sends a like, who sends me a DM. I see you. I hear you. I truly love you because I want you to still exist. I want you to be the best examples of the blessings that have been brought forth. I am a firm believer and I've told my children before you were even a, before you were even a thought you were loved. And I want everybody to understand that about themselves. Wow. On that note, Florence Taylor, you have left us with a beautiful word. Thank you so much for talking with me today. Tell us where we can find you on the social. I am on Instagram, uh, FT mom, the numeral three. So F T M O N M the number three. I want TikTok, but I'm so corny on TikTok. All you'll see is like a photo montage and songs. And, <laughs> and that's pretty much it. You'll, you'll see me in face group, Facebook groups and things of that sort. I'm here. I'm available. If anybody ever wants a DM and they, they want a shoulder to lean on, or they want some swing advice. I don't know everything. Um, but we can stumble through it together, y'all. We can do this all together. Someone who is going to help you help yourself. She's she's available. If you are a person who runs a company and are passing out affiliate links, here's an affiliate for you. Um, so Florence, thank you so much for this conversation today. This has been just a delight. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa. I am blowing kisses to Lisa, those who are not on her Patreon, who should be on her Patreon because this is a black owned business. And if you say black lives matter, black money matters, please do so and subscribe. Thank you. Yes. You've been listening to the Stitch Please podcast, the official podcast of Black Women Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. We appreciate you supporting us by listening to the podcast. If you'd like to reach out to us with questions, you can contact us at blackwomenstitch at gmail.com. If you'd like to support us financially, you can do that by supporting us on Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And you can find Black Women Stitch there in the Patreon directory. And for as little as $2 a month, you can help support the project with things like editing, transcripts, and other things to strengthen the podcast. And finally, if financial support is not something you can do right now, you can really, really help the podcast by rating it and reviewing it anywhere you listen to podcasts that allows you to review them. So I know that not all podcast directories or services allow for reviews, but for those who do, for those that have like a star rating or just ask for a few comments, if you could share those comments and say nice things about us at the Stitch Please podcast, that is incredibly helpful. Thank you so much. Come back next week and we'll help you get your stitch together.